All right, so it's 10.03. Let's go ahead and get started. <clears throat> we'll probably be a smaller group today, which is great. Hopefully we'll have um, plenty of time to answer all of your questions um, before we wrap up today. So welcome to the workshop on incorporating FAO library resources into your online courses. Um, we're scheduled to run until 11 today, so um, we'll make sure that we we're wrap up by then to respect everyone's time. My name is Gina schlesselman -Tarango. Um, If I haven't met you already, I am the coordinator of library instruction at the FAO library. Um, before I cover what we're going to review today, I just want to really quickly um, let you know about some of our upcoming workshops. Um, in case you didn't see this. Um, so next Tuesday, my colleague Barbara is going to be offering um, a workshop on streaming video. She'll cover that a little bit today. Um, today is sort of a, uh, a quick snapshot of some of these other workshops where we'll have more time to go into more detail. Um, next Wednesday, my colleague Eric and I are going to be covering digital resources to support student research. So that's more in detail about instruction options as well as digital collections um, that we have and that um, are, are available elsewhere for student research. My colleague Stacy um, on August 5th will be going into more detail about online course readings. Um, so if you have um, lots of questions that come come up today, this might be a good one to attend, um, focusing on books and articles. And then um, finally, my colleague Kim is going to be offering a session on August 12th about copyright and your course, um, specific look, specifically looking at fair use in the online teaching environment. So let me navigate back to where I was. Um, so your presenters today include uh, Stacy Magadans, who is the coordinator of electronic resources and serials. Hi, Stacy. Um, Barbara Corton, who is the coordinator of library media services. Hi, Barbara. Um, Kim Wabick, who is our head of access services. Um, and then myself, again, I am the coordinator of our library instruction program. Um, so before we get started, I'm going to run a quick uh, poll here in Zoom just to see where everyone's at as far as um, their experience with using library resources in the online teaching environment. So you should all see this poll um, that asks, have you incorporated FAO library resources into your online courses? The options are yes, a lot. Um, yes, but spring was the first time because we were all forced to, right? Or you have never done so. All right, I see responses coming in. All right, do you all see those results? Okay, great. So it looks like the majority of us have not. So this um, will hopefully be really useful information for you. Um, for those of you who have incorporated library resources this spring, um, if anything can, comes up and you have tips or tricks that worked, um, don't hesitate to share those with us. So I will go ahead and turn it over to Stacy. Um, and like I said, we'll have time for questions and answers at the end um, for Q&A. So go ahead and hold any questions you have. Um, we might, you might find that um, as we, you know, progress through the workshop today, we answer some of those questions that come up. All right, so Stacy, it's all yours. You're muted, Stacy. Thank you. I'm going to set myself a timer so that I do not yak on and on. Okay, so um, hello everyone. My name is Stacy Maganans. I am the coordinator for electronic resources here at File Library. Um, and I'm going to talk about some basics about linking to library subscription based resources in your Blackboard courses. So um, as you are hopefully aware, we have many, many useful resources online, uh, the vast majority of which are behind paywalls, meaning the, the library subscribes on behalf of the university so that all of our students and employees can use them. Um, you might recall earlier this uh, spring when the closures first came down, I sent out a lot of messages about uh, publishers having made their resources temporarily free, uh, that is to say removing them from behind their paywalls. Um, which was quite unusual, and, and now most of that material is gone. But that might have prompted you to ask, um, how is it that 
people know when you are paying for something or not paying for something if they are keeping their content uh, secured in that way. So the way that um, publishers and information providers do this is by a combination of a couple of things, either by requiring a login uh, from your home institution, and they will know that your home institution is a subscriber, uh, or by, um, for example, navigating through the campus network. But in all cases, they do require some sort of login. So in order to make these things available to your students seamlessly, you need to be a little bit conscious of how you link to them. So I'm going to show you a couple of basic things about that. And in an effort to, pre to preserve bandwidth, I will stop my video and I will share my screen. There we go. OK. So I did put into the chat um, a link to our library guide on linking to library resources. There is a page with all sorts of um, detailed instructions on it. And um, normally there's a couple of ways you can get to that. We do have a whole section here on the library's homepage of our library guides. Um, but the simplest way to pull it up is here in OneSearch if you just type the word linking. Um, I have set OneSearch so that if you type that word, it will point you to this linking to library resources guide. So this is intended for any instructor uh, who wants to use our resources in their web pages. So the basics, um, you do need to have a stable or a durable URL, something that isn't going to go away. Um, there are some databases that provide what are called dynamic URLs and they don't stay. Um, EBSCOhost is one of the big examples of that. So you want to watch for things that say stable or durable. Um, the proxy server, and that's this information here, that's one of those things I mentioned that um, will route users through the right login no matter where they are so that they will get seamless access. And so there's a couple of ways you can approach this. If you want to link directly to say a article in one of our databases and out on the web such as Wiley Online Library for instance. You can link directly to it but you might need to add this little bit of proxy information. Um, the other way you can get around this is to link to something of the libraries. For instance one of our library guides, or one of our lists of databases, or even things from OneSearch. So let me give you just a very quick taste of what some of that is like. Um, and you will notice too, before I leave this, there are tabs on this guide for different types of things that you might want to link to in one of your courses. So I'm going to show you um, a real simple one with an ebook from, this is OneSearch, the library's uh, big, broad search that covers both books, articles, videos, all kinds of things. But I'm here looking at um, only eBooks. And so here's a book that is available online. And when I click the title, if I look up at the top, it has a thing called a permalink that is also a stable link or a durable link. There's different terminology for those. Uh, and we have a couple of different copies of this. We have it in a couple of different places. So I could, if I wanted to, oops, I'm not on that. I could, if I wanted to, link directly to one of these. Um, but it's just easier to take the permalink that's here. And I click permalink. It gives me this. I say copy permalink to clipboard, which I have done. And now, if I wanted to go over to my Blackboard course, I am here in my content section. I want to add some content. Um, I typically just throw these in as web links. So I would just get my web link here. I would paste that stable, durable URL. This is a pandemic ebook, right? You can call it whatever you want. You can give it a description if you want to. Uh, and then when you're done, you can just say submit, which I have 
put it up. And then you will have a link to that item. Here is my pandemic ebook. And this is where it would take your students. So they could then hop onto whatever link they wanted. Okay, so that's, that's the easiest way is to just copy, if it's in one search, just copy the permalink in one search. Uh, another way to go about this, um, some of the uh, library's individual databases. Uh, here I have EBSCOhost Academic Search Premier. Uh, some of our individual databases also have permalinks. So here, say, is an article, a full text article, and I want to go ahead and link my students to it so that they can read it. Here, um, this as the full text, and there's this long URL up here, and you might be tempted to copy that, but, but that one has two problems. Um, it has, first of all, uh, it's not stable, and um, it's a little bit iffy how it's including the um, proxy information. So here again, you have a permalink down at the side, here in this permalink, uh, EBSCOhost has gone ahead and put, hopefully you can see it there, the proxy information for me. So I don't have to do anything to it. I could again just copy and paste that into my Blackboard course. There will be other situations where, um, you know, if you want to, as I said, link directly to something in a big database like Wiley or Springer, where you might need to do that manual work of first pasting the prefix onto the URL that you copy. But all of that is covered in great detail on our library guide here about linking. And if it is a subject that interests you, I will be, um, as Gina mentioned, doing a full session on just this. Um, well, actually, also uh, quickly how to find these things and then also how to link to them. I'll be doing that in its own session later on. So I am kind of at the edge of my time, so I will stop. All right, I'm good. <laughs> Thanks, Stacy. This is Barbara. Hello, everybody. I'm going to share my screen. Everybody see that? Okay, so hello everybody. I'm Barbara Quarton. I'm the coordinator of um, media services right now in, this, in the Fowl Library. And um, I am very happy to see your, your thumbnails. And I wish we could get together in person. I hope you're all really doing well during this very unfortunate and somewhat challenging time. But I'm going to turn off my video. So all you see is my thumbnail. And I thought we could talk about how to locate streaming video for your online courses. So the library has several streaming video databases. And today I'll introduce you to just a few of them. If you're interested in a more in-depth look, I'm offering another Zoom workshop next Tuesday, July 28th at 10 a.m. So we start at the library homepage and we'll use OneSearch, which for us, it, it searches at all of the library's collection, but for today and for my area here, it searches all of our um, video databases at once. And so if you have a topic and you want to see what videos we have on that topic, just type it here. And my topic today is racism. And you need to always choose books and media. Now you'll see that there are many results, but we are getting some books. So we should go immediately to the left hand side and click on video. And these will be all of the videos that have to do with racism that are available. So that's a long list. Sometimes you can change this sort to date newest if you'd like to see the one that's the newest. And so let's look at it. It's called Cooked, Survival by Zip Code. 
we can just click on the title and we just get more information about this video. But the most important part here is to take a look where it says online, excuse me, available online at. This one is available on DocuSeq too. This is one of our databases. And I'll just give you a quick peek. <clears throat> so this is DocuSeq, and this is where we would click on the arrow to begin the video. But please notice that there are many other things going on here. You can see a full description of the video. You can see reviews, and this is really important, and your students will be very happy about it. You can choose a citation style and then just copy and paste it into the, uh, your bibliography or your reference works, your reference page. And I would love to, to begin this video, but we could go off on, on a tangent. So I won't do that today. But again, we'll be doing a lot of this next week too. So we'll go back to OneSearch and we'll take a look at if you have a specific title in mind. Let's say that one of your, fat, your uh, colleagues suggested a particular video and you want to find out if we have it. So you just type in the, the uh, title. And again, we do books and media. And then video. Now, if we have it, it will be the first or second hit. And make sure that you choose the one that says video, not the one that says DVD, because in, in COVID times, this may not work for you. So you would just click on that to get more information about the video and then to find out where it is online. And in this case, it's in one of our databases, Academic Video Online, which we call Avon. Let's peek at that. So you can see that it jumps you right into the film itself and you, you get all of these various pieces of information up here. And there's that beloved citing tool that your students will be thrilled about. And you can, of course, browse each database on its own. So you would just completely bypass one search and choose a database here. And then go down. This is an alphabetical list. Go to video. And these are all our video databases. I'll do a quick intro of some of them. So we were just in Avon, Academic Video Online. And um, it's our biggest video database with around 700, excuse me, 7,000 videos. There are documentaries, lectures, interviews, counseling sessions, and newsreels, and so on. It's massive. And because it's so big, it covers most disciplines. We also have Media Education Foundation. And it really has some beautifully produced and thought-provoking documentaries on gender and culture and race and mass media. And it produces, MEF produces and distributes its own documentaries, but they don't have a streaming service. So they use Canopy's platform. See, it says Canopy here, but the collection is actually the Media Education Foundation. And we were just in DocuSeq 2. And this is uh, documentaries by independent filmmakers. It's a small collection. It has about 800 films um, on uh, social and environmental issues. And you may have heard of Canopy. It offers movies and foreign films and classic cinema, and it has an awesome interface, and it is much beloved across the country. Um, however, for us, only faculty may request new titles from Canopy because 
um, it's a little bit more uh, expensive and uh, and so on from our annual databases because we have to sort of rent them all individually. And so there will be much more about that piece next week. The thing that students love about all these databases is that they all have that citation tool and um, that gives them the freedom to, to choose a film that they really want for their topic while knowing that they have help in citing it. So now, as Stacy mentioned earlier, you can link directly to videos in your Blackboard course. And Stacy created a library guide here, um, uh, streaming video tips for instructors. And that will give you everything you need to know about how to link to a video. Basically, I won't go over it, but basically when you're at the main page of a video like we were before, you copy the URL and make sure that the URL has the library's proxy prefix in it, which is this. And then you paste it into a content item, usually a web link in your Blackboard course. But remember, if it doesn't have that proxy prefix, it's not going to play. So there are other library guides here that will help you. For example, if you need more information about Canopy, and if you feel like you might want to use streaming video in your course, this library guide will give you some um, suggested um, web pages that you can go to for suggested assignments and so on. Um, there's a lot of information out there. Many faculty are beginning to incorporate video into their classrooms and it's, um, it's it, it's very engaging for the students and faculty find it to be a very good addition to their class. Now there's some times that you may or your students may run into technical issues when you are um, playing videos and um, in anticipation of that we've created this this uh, page that gives you some of the more common problems and some possible solutions to that. So it looks like I am out of time and I will thank you and I will pass it along to my uh, colleague Kim Wobick, who is the head of access services for the library. Thank you, Barbara, and good morning, everybody. Uh, as head of access services, you, as you're passing through the library, you may have seen me at the checkout desk, and I also oversee um, interlibrary loan, which we'll be talking about in a moment. So what I wanted to make sure everybody knew about today is a little bit more information about what we offer through course reserves, as well as interlibrary loan, and perhaps a little bit of info about copyright. Uh, interspersed in there as well. Uh, so the first thing that and the most important as we end our summer term and get into full gear for our new fall semester is the course reserves which traditionally have been the majority of the materials are on print. Now how does that course reserves collection develop? So really what happens is the library is in contact with the bookstore uh, working backwards here and the bookstore gets their information from you the faculty member who teaches the class and is letting them know the required books that you will be using potentially in your class. So the library takes that list. Um, we figure out what we own already what we can purchase and I say can uh, because unfortunately we're not able to purchase everything as part of the affordable learning solutions initiative here on campus we do dedicate a certain percentage of our funds uh, to textbooks required books because not all, re all not all textbooks are not all required books are textbooks um, as we'll see in a moment, uh, but we are not able to purchase everything. So, and in this uh, world of COVID now, uh, 
what our efforts have really been directed to is purchasing ebooks uh, when available uh, from our various vendors and from the various publishers. And that has seen some success, but uh, it really need to let you know that we are not able to purchase all of the required textbooks as ebooks. And that's for a couple different reasons. Probably the most major one is some of the larger companies such as Pearson. Um, Pearson's the biggest one that I can think of off the top of my head. Actually do not allow libraries to purchase institutional copies of ebook textbooks. Um, because as you can imagine, they would like to have the students purchase them or rent them. So we try to help as much as we can and we'll talk about um, what our options are in just a moment. So first is how do you get to Course Reserve to see what's there? So I'm on the library homepage. I scroll down a, a little bit and you'll see that Course Reserves has its own tile. It is a separate section of our library catalog. Um, this is the most direct way to get there and this is how your students do it. And you can see that we already have a number of courses listed. So you can search by the course uh, number or um, instructor's name and that will appear. And I'll just click on one here to show you what that looks like. So the anything that has been required that the library has for Biology 431 uh, will show up here as a link. And this is a link to um, the catalog as well. But what you'll see here is who wrote the book, how long it can be checked out for. So a student can come and check out this book for two hours. And you'll notice that it has a, a different call number. So what this basically is, is a personal copy that the professor uh, bar lent to the library so that students could use them. And if I click on this, another piece of information um, that is important as well, especially if the student is at the library in person, is if it's available or not. So it, turns, it looks like we have one copy and that copy happens to be available on the shelf. Um, but first, to back up a half step, a little bit about a little bit more about how those books get on reserve. So I talked about previously that the library will put the titles on reserve that we already own um, and that we are able to purchase. And so you'll see them with a traditional uh, library call number, which is letters and numbers. However, because of the fact that we cannot purchase all of the books or we may not have enough copies of the required title to support the number of students in the class. Historically, a lot of faculty members have had their own copies that they have contributed to the course reserve collection, uh, perhaps for the term that they're teaching a particular class in, or just as um, a permanent addition. And those um, copies, as you see here, are assigned um, a different type of call number to make it easy for staff to locate to borrow to students. Um, so in this case, actually a little information about that because for the fall semester, as all courses will be online, um, we are waiting on information from the bookstore to find out uh, a more complete list of required books that are being, that will be used uh, for fall semester. And we may, we will be working probably the first, through the first couple weeks of fall semester to actually let me get back to course reserves to develop a more complete course reserves list that will be visible through here and if you search it right away uh, for your course number now um, that you're teaching the fall we have not started that work yet so you will not find it uh, what we're doing is actually uh, cleaning up um, as would say our old course reserves because all the course numbers and the names are changing. So we are anticipating putting in all new information. So once we get the information from the bookstore and about the books, we will go through our process. Uh, however, if you have not, if you as the faculty member have not communicated either with your department or with the bookstore as to what book you're using, you may not find that on here. And you are welcome to contact um, the circulation desk or myself personally um, to let us know about your book on reserve and we will try to add it. So either we will own it or we will try to purchase it. And again, the more notice we have the better uh, because there is no guarantee that we can purchase your book. So 
with that said, so I'm talking a lot about the physical collections, but knowing that all of our courses online or will be online, how does that help if we have the physical book? So there's a couple things that we can do for you. We will not be checking out physical copies of course reserves to students um, in the fall because of difficulties with quarantining that material to make sure that it is germ free for the next user. Uh, but what I can do for you, let's go back to the home screen. If the book is not, oh dear, if the book is not available as an ebook, if I go home and what I'm going to do is click on our online library information that we've developed specifically for COVID. And we're going to go here to textbook info, faculty information. And I believe I'm in the wrong place. And that's more information about um, how we purchase um, eBooks and such. And I apologize because I know, oh, here we go. Um, unfortunately, um, I had the, um, our thumbnails in place in, um, over the piece I needed. So under textbooks, faculty information, uh, there is a box called course reserves during closure. So what we can do is scan a few chapters of your required textbook and what will happen is I will, we will scan it, I will mail it to you or email it to you and you can put it in Blackboard for access by your entire class. Uh, we do not make scan requests for students, um, but just for faculty, be, the goal is to make a uh, scan of the chapters you request accessible to as many people as possible and that would be through the class you're teaching um, through the Blackboard class. And so we're pretty quick about these scans so there's just some basic information that we need and then you submit it and it gets sent to me and then we will be in contact about that. Uh, the other service I wanted to make sure that you're aware of fully is our interlibrary loan service, which is free um, to the entire campus community, staff, students, and faculty. And you may have already used it in the past, but it's never um, a bad thing to be reminded about free services. Uh, so to make a request, there's a number of different ways you can make requests. So we won't go through all of them now. Um, you do need to be signed on. And this is taking me directly to the, the interlibrary loan request site. So you, uh, interlibrary loan is currently processing requests for journal articles and for book chapters. And you can hear my timer going off. Oh, sorry. And um, so you can make requests for journal articles and book chapters. And for the fall, we are currently developing a plan to um, allow books or requests for full books again and how to deliver those to you. And there, and part of that plan is also um, initiate, having you as a user initiate requests for books that are in our library um, that we can deliver to you either through a curbside delivery service or a locker as the library will not be open uh, for browsing um, physically, um, but you can definitely browse through the library catalog. And uh, so you do have a few different ways to get the information that you need. Um, for your research, um, additional information for your class. And at any time, uh, there are library, almost 24-7, um, there are librarians that can help you answer your questions through the Ask a Librarian. Um, and this would include asking questions about um, how to, who to contact about course reserve, uh, how to make an interlibrary loan request, um, that sort of thing. And briefly about copyright, because you may have a number of articles already saved um, from previous classes that you want to use in um, your Blackboard course, or you have a copy of the book you're using and you're wondering, can I scan the whole thing myself and put it up? Um, there are specific guidelines that are, that do guide um, how you can use uh, electronic information scanned 
information um, in your courses. Generally, journal articles, actually across the board, linking is best. So we cannot stress more using our OneSearch search box uh, to see what the library has access to. We have access to quite a bit, um, both in eBooks, electronic journal articles uh, that make it really easy, as Stacy pointed out, um, to put a link into your Blackboard class so that your students just click the link and it takes them to the article. And that is the most straightforward way you can do it. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail here. As, uh, Gina mentioned there, is, there will be a, a workshop in mid-August. Uh, we'll go into a copyright a little bit more and talk about fair use um, because you can put use information for your classes, but you just have to um, be aware of the guidelines. So we'll talk about that later. So I'll turn it over to Gina now. All right, um, so I should have my screen up. Can you all see that? I don't think anyone has their video on to confirm. Can yes. You? Okay, I see a thumbs up, thank you. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about our library instruction options. We have many, um, but I'm gonna start with um, one that I know some of you in the session have taken advantage of, um, <clears throat> and some of you um, might not have. So we're going to go to services on the home page here. And if you scroll all the way down to the right, um, we have a box here that is titled services, Oops. services for faculty. What I'm going to pop down to is the fourth link here, request, request an instruction session. And what this allows you to do is essentially put in a request that a librarian um, work with you to develop a, um, a workshop or a, a, a class session. Some, some people call this a lecture, um, but basically something for your students, right, that speaks to the research assignment at hand. Um, these can look a lot of different ways. So this could, um, depending on your needs, this could be um, sort of an active learning session where you explore different citation styles with the students. Um, it could be something where the librarian comes in and um, explains the difference, differences and utilities between popular and scholarly sources and demonstrates some databases. Really, we tailor these sessions um, based on your needs and your students' needs. So if you're interested in something like that, um, you would fill out this form. I won't go into detail here. You know, it's pretty self-explanatory. We ask for your course information, um, the number of students you have, when the class begins and ends, preferred date. Um, we do ask that you provide a first and second choice. Um, and then here, this is um, pretty important, especially in this era of online instruction, preferred mode. Um, typically when campus is open, um, we meet with your students either in the library, you'll come to one of our teaching spaces, or we will go to your classroom. However, um, with COVID, we're doing this all online, and you have the option to select a synchronous session that we will um, work with you to do through Zoom, like we're doing today. Um, and we do ask that if you make, if you select that, that you, um, you do attend. We sometimes um, have faculty who have a conference or, or some sort of competing thing, but oftentimes if the faculty member isn't there, we're not able to answer all of the students' questions about the assignment or class. Um, the other option is no location. Um, we are offering pre-recorded um, videos of our instruction sessions for asynchronous learners. I know there are pros and cons to, you know, synchronous and asynchronous learning. And so um, that is an option too. Just like with the course reserves request or scan request, um, the earlier you get your instruction request in, the better we do ask for at least one week advance. Um, an advance warning so that I as instruction coordinator can find the librarian who is available and best suited to working with you um, and the librarian has time to prepare the materials. Um, we also ask that you attach an assignment or three things that you want your students to learn. Again, this just allows the librarian to best prepare. Um, if you are listing three things you want your students to learn, please be as specific as possible. If you just write, I want my st students to learn how to research, that's not particularly helpful. Um, something a little more specific is, is going to be better there. 
And so um, you, after that, you would go ahead and submit this form that actually comes to me as the coordinator. And again, I will um, identify a librarian, could be me, um, could be one of my colleagues who will work with you um, for that. So um, that is the first piece I wanted to cover. I'm going to go back here to services back down to services for faculty. And I'm gonna open up our CIL lab, Toolkit for Teaching and Learning. CIL stands for Critical Information Literacy. And I'll go ahead and share this link in the chat here. There we go. Um, and this online lab essentially gives you a bunch of different tools um, for you as instructors, as faculty to incorporate information literacy into your own assignment design, assessment, into your own courses. Um, because we know that what we do as librarians is really meant to um, supplement and reinforce what you're doing with students in the classroom. And so there's a lot going on here. I want to point out just two pieces. First is this instructor's corner. And here we have um, a few different links, but you'll notice we have SLO1, SLO2, SLO3. That stands for Student Learning Outcome. And these are the library's um, critical information literacy learning outcomes. And so based on your needs, your student needs, your assignment design, you can navigate to um, one that you're interested in. So let's say you're looking at this fifth one attribution, you know, you really want to get your students to understand why we why we cite. We'll click on that. And we have for you um, various resources to help you do that. <clears throat> the critical piece of critical information literacy is that um, we want students to not only know how to do things like know how to correctly cite or know how to find a resource, but we also want them to think about the information that they're engaging with and specifically think critically. Um, and so these prompts like discussion prompts, class activities, um, other resources like videos, handouts, guides, infographics, etc. These all um, provide space for you to do just that. And the nice thing about a lot of these resources is that um, they are, you can tailor them based on the class level and um, they'll really allow you, allow you to scaffold that learning in your course. So check that out if you're interested in um, incorporating CIL into your class and just looking for some ideas or some really good stuff there. Um, also in the instructor's corner, we have CIL assignment ideas from CSUSB faculty. So we have worked with faculty in various capacities um, over the years, workshops, grants, professional development opportunities. And um, we have received permission from some of those faculty to share their CIL assignments. So again, if you're looking for ideas, feel free to browse this list. Um, these top two were created um, just this winter um, in, in preparation for the for um, general edu education courses in the new um, GE program in the semester system, but we have some here dating back to 2016 from different disciplines. Okay, so I'm going to pop over to video tutorials. Um, <clears throat> and if you weren't aware, we have created um, many online online learning tools for you, but these are these are pretty popular. So we have you'll notice we have three tutorials, one for beginning researchers, one for intermediate researchers and one for advanced researchers. And each tutorial consists of a series of videos, um, and each video is uh, three to four minutes long, um, followed by an online quiz that students can take. Um, faculty find it, find it useful to assign these um, before a research project because it introduces students to some really essential um, ideas, concepts, and skills related to research. Um, and some also, um, We'll have students um, view these um, in class and then complete the, the quiz independently. So it's, it really is up to you as far as how you incorporate this into, into your learning environment. But I'll just show you quickly what this looks like. So if we're interested in tutorial two for intermediate researchers, um, you would go ahead and click on the first link here, which will take you to the first video in this series. And this one covers the peer review process. Um, the learning outcomes that the video addresses are listed at the top. This here is the video itself. 
And then you'll notice below each video, we have vocabulary terms that the video addresses. So here we have peer review, scholarly journal, and scholarly journal article. Um, and these vocabulary terms are based on what we as librarians experienced as points of confusion for students. And so we really wanted to draw these out um, and clearly define them. Um, and these vocabulary terms, again, do show up on the quiz as well as in these videos. So after students view this, they can navigate to the next page here. Um, and that will take them to the next video. This one is about the literature and literature reviews and why we engage in attribution. The final video in this um, tutorial is um, intermediate um, database searching. So it covers phrase searching and truncation. And then if we navigate to the final page here, this takes them to the quiz and it's all online. Um, when students complete the quiz, they get a digital certificate of completion that has their score. They can um, upload that quiz to Blackboard after downloading or they can email it to you. It's really your preference um, and they can take it as many times as they would like. So what we recommend is um, as, as professors, as faculty, you uh, sort of set the bar for what you want students to achieve on the quiz. So when I've taught courses before, I have required that students um, get like at least an 80, 85 percent um, and then they upload the, that score. And again, students can take this as many times as they want, you know, until they get 100 percent. Um, and again, there is a quiz for each tutorial. So for beginners, which um, is geared towards new students, maybe transfer students, this intermediate um, tutorial is geared towards upper division students. And then um, the advanced one is more for sort of the graduate level or maybe um, uh, upper division honors courses and things like that. But as, as instructors, you can of course sort of mix and match these, select certain videos you want students to, to view depending on your needs. All right, so I'm going to quickly show you a few other things on the home page here. I know I'm probably taking up a little too much time here. We want to make sure you have time for questions and answers. Um, just want to point out here this tile workshops. Um, you're all here, so you know you know how to get to workshops. But during the, the academic year, we offer a variety of workshops for students that you can, um, if you choose, provide them extra credit for attending. Um, we just sort of refined that process in this online environment. So um, if your students attend at the end of the workshop, they'll have an opportunity to basically submit your information and the librarian teaching the workshop will email you confirming that the student attended. And as you know, a Zoom, it's pretty fancy. So we can see on the back end, you know, if they actually attended for the whole thing or just the last two minutes. Um, and we'll, we'll let you know that if they weren't there for the whole thing. Um, we also have re recorded workshops here. This is how you would access those. So this takes you to the workshop calendar. And on the bottom left, um, if you click recorded online workshops, this takes you to our YouTube channel. So if your students weren't able to make the workshop on, you know, the citation style or Google Scholar, whatever, they can access it here. Um, our YouTube channel, by the way, is a really good resource. We have lots of other videos there, um, some how-to videos for different databases and search skills. So you can check that out as well. And as Stacy showed you, any of our videos you can link to in YouTube, as well as just those tutorials I showed you, those are all open access, so you don't have to worry about proxy linking with um, anything in the CIL lab. Let me go back home here. Um, last thing I want to show you uh, is how to get to library guides. I know some of my colleagues have shown you guides for linking and for video, but these are useful for students too. So if I scroll here to the middle and click on library guides, um, we have so many on so many topics, but let's say you're interested in um, have helping your students learn how to how to cite an APA style. You could navigate to citing and writing here on the left and then um, click on APA citation guide. And this is a really good resource for students. Um, and so again, you can link to any of these in uh, your Blackboard course and you don't need to, to um, create a proxy link for these. We can also work with you to create a specific guide for your course to where we can um, collect per, you know, useful information and search tips for your students. And then last but not least, I know Kim um, showed you this, but if you or your students ever need help, um, we have the Ask a Librarian option where you can contact a librarian 
um, live. <clears throat> and then we also offer research appointments directly below. So if you or your students would like a one on one zoom consultation, they can make an appointment with us. Um, they would select the librarian here or if they have no preference, they could leave that at the default. Um, and then they would select a date and time that works for them. And um, we can meet again meet with them one on one and help them um, navigate through that research process. So I'm going to go into some more detail on the workshop on the 29th um, with my colleague Eric about um, tools we have available, instructional resources and digital um, archival collections that you might be able to use in your courses if you're interested in that. But I will stop for now and um, we'll go ahead and take questions. And um, it's a small group, so feel free to use your mic if you would like, or um, you can pre